Well, welcome. <clears throat> I guess this is on. Well, I'll speak loud enough if it isn't. But um, let's see. Hello. I don't. Um, anyhow. Um, welcome to Third World in Perspective Program Seminar Series. Um, I believe this is the fourth one we've had this year. And that's what we usually have, two a semester. And um, we feel this is good academic enrichment for the students and also anybody that's interested from the community. Um, and uh, in fact, we have two people here this evening, my, two of my friends, Dr. Lopez, Augusto Lopez, and uh, his wife, Lillian Lopez. And they've been coming to these programs for years. In fact, we were coming in the building, pulled up at the same time outside. You mentioned it's been some time since we've been in this building. But um, actually, we used to have most of our seminars in this building until they built the Student Success Center. And then we started going over there, and, and then the scheduling got kind of tight, so we had to come over here. And um, so um, this is not unfamiliar. Well, we I'm not going to... Um, I want to also recognize um, two of our faculty members sitting in the second row here, uh, Dr. Susan Bragg, who um, is really contributing a great deal in teaching women's history and, um, and black history. And uh, we appreciate that. And then right next to her, another colleague goes back a little further, not that much, <laughs> just about 10 years, Dr. Richard Hall, who's a European historian, but also if you ask him to give a lecture on Mexico, he can do that, which I did when he came here for his interview. But this evening, uh, and I welcome you, and uh, I appreciate your attendance, all, everyone here. Um, all students and so forth. Because um, I know Dr. Tu has some students here and I have some students. Dr. Smedra has some students here and I have sign-up sheets that um, I, I uh, placed on the left and on the right. So if you all would sign those uh, sheets, uh, sign-up uh, sheets. I'd appreciate it. Um, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Tu and Dr. Stahl and Dr. Smedley. And that's the order they will speak about their experiences in China this past summer. And it's highly unusual for us to have three faculty members that go to the same country in one year. And um, I'm sure that they derived a great deal from it, uh, and I'm sure you will from hearing their present presentations. Right. Come in. Uh, Doc too has an excellent background um, from Texas. Got her BS her uh, BS degree, chemistry, and her PhD in medical science from, uh, well, she got the BS degree in chemistry from Baylor University and a PhD in medical science from Texas A&M University. And um, prior to coming here for about 10 years, she spent in Jefferson County, Alabama. You probably heard about that in the elections last night. And the main city in Jefferson County is Birmingham, Alabama. 
where she taught at Jefferson County Community College, but was mostly University of Alabama and Birmingham, UAB, which we hear about. We don't hear so much academic. All these places we hear about the teams, and there's nothing wrong with that. And they also have academic programs. But she, she spent, <laughs> she spent, uh, <laughs> she spent um, uh, 10 years there and was a postdoctoral fellow and also a research uh, professor in uh, microbiology, mainly, and uh, she developed uh, many, with her colleagues, many vaccines um, that were helpful to people. And, uh, well, I, I talked about neighbors, and uh, there are two neighbors just came in, right, actually live right across the street from me, Mary and uh, uh, Charlie Davis. Um, Dr. Davis, um, of course, practiced medicine here uh, for years, and um, uh, Mary, of course, uh, worked for DFACS, I believe, for about 30 years. And um, Faye Fagan, who uh, had been on our faculty in Asian Studies program for many years, and I appreciate you coming. This, this really is, is Asian, no matter fact. And I want to say thank you to Bob Slanker, who um, tapes our programs from Instructional Technology. And if you want to see a tape of this program, uh, Turn on channel 16. Uh, it would be uh, um, probably the beginning of next week. You can just go on our website, and go under instructional technology, and uh, click on the schedule, and uh, it it should be there. But anyhow, this is the way we get out in the community. Well, Dr. Tu uh, is a dis dis distinguished scholar. She's won many awards. Most memorable is the recent award, the GSW Featured Scholar Award, which Dr. Blanchard created uh, to recognize outstanding scholarship uh, at the university. This is something we really needed, and Dr. Hall also uh, was a recipient of that award for uh, authoring. Um, several books. Um, but anyhow, she um, spent last summer several weeks at Tianjin, Tianjin University of Science and Technology, and then she traveled throughout China. So um, she's going to be the first speaker, and then Dr. Stoff and Dr. Smedrick. So please join me in welcoming once again, because she has appeared several times. Uh, at this forum, uh, Dr. Tu, to our seminar. Okay, I just want to, uh, I'm going to start the PowerPoint, uh, tell you the reason why I choose Tianjin University. Actually, we call it TUS. It's Tianjin University for Science and of, of Science and Technology. And the reason why you, I choose Tianjin is because we have several biology students. Um, from China, actually they're doing the one two one program and they come here and they, they it's a joint program between GSW and um, Tufts University. And so they finish up and they have gone back and they both, they, all of them has biology degree. So because of that, you know, my relationship, I was very close to the student, they were doing research with me. And so they said, why don't you come over and visit us, so, you know, because I hear a lot about China and in case most of you know I'm Asian but I'm not Chinese, I'm Vietnamese. I, and I've been to other countries, I've been to Japan, I've been to Austria, I've been to many of the countries, but I have not, I've been to Europe, I just have never been to China, and I really, I love to travel, and I love to see uh, other culture, and of course learn about their food and, and, and the people, All right, and so that's why I choose Tianjin, and when I, um, let me pop this up, I didn't know what Tianjin is on the map, so I pull up a map of China, and I can look and Dr. Stoff and uh, Dr. Metro will uh, be telling you about the other city that, all right? So here's Tianjin, right here. It's north of China, right? here's Beijing, all right? And there's Tianjin, okay? Um, and then I traveled to Xi'an, China, which is down here, 
Okay, so I flew into Beijing first, all right? And then what I did was uh, they picked me up from Beijing and they dro drove me to Tianjin, all right? And then I was there for three weeks. And during that time, I took off maybe a few days on the weekend. And when I do have time, I go back to Beijing for the sightseeing because during the, 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 during the week, we actually do a lot of teaching. So that was that. Uh, and then after about three weeks at Tianjin, I finished my teaching and I extended for about uh, maybe four or five more days. Uh, and then I stay, um, I went from Tianjin, I uh, took a train. Uh, I seriously um, travel the Chinese way, right? And I took the train by myself right? <laughs> from Tianjin to Xi'an. And that was an eight hour uh, train ride. Uh, and then after I finished here, I turned around and I flew back. I bought a, a, a plane ticket to go back to Tianjin. My, one of my Chinese students was supposed to travel with me, but at the last minute he has an exam. So he said, I'm sorry, I can't go with you. And you know, if you, have, you don't know the language, and which I don't, and I tried to learn it, but every time I speak the language, nobody understands me, right? And so it was very difficult. And I was very scared because you get stuck on that train and you don't know where to get off because I know it's eight hour, but how do you know when you get to the right stop? And what happened you go past that stop, all right? Um, so before I left, I had gotten them to write me little short sentences like, I want to leave, come up, you know, get off at Xi'an. And, you know, and all these phrases. And I really listen carefully every time there's a stop, especially when we get to about seven and a half hour into the ride. Because I want to make sure I don't miss that stop and then go to whoever, nowhere in China, I'll land. All right? Um, but it was an interesting experience, all right? And I've learned a lot. So now what I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit. I'm going to divide my talk into two parts. The first part is going to be about the university and about the student. The second part is going to be what I've experienced in terms of my travel around other places. Okay? Feel free to ask me questions if there's something you don't understand. Okay, so here is, I'm assuming if you speak Chinese, that's the test. Okay? Tianjin University of Science and Technology and some of the building there. Okay? This is where they, I stay. I, there's two buildings here. There's one here, and you can't see this one's cut off. This one over here is actually for graduate students from coming from other countries. And over here is for faculty. And they're very close. I, and there are faculty coming from other countries that are staying here. And some of those faculty have been there for several years. Okay? So they put me in these rooms. And these rooms actually are very nice. It's, it's got a kitchen. It's got um, a, a window, a room unit. A for AC, um, so it's very comfortable, okay? This is the library. I wanted to see what is the difference between the university there and the university here, okay? And so I asked my student to take me to the library and I want to look at computer access, I want to see the seating, I want to see how students study in the library. And what was fascinating to me is that the seats are like this. You have tons of seats, but at every seat you see books. I, and sometimes there are a lot of students sitting there, and sometimes they're not, but they're just books at every place. <laughs> I, you can connect with that, right? So, and then a student told me that they go in there to study, but they can't find a place to sit. And I said, but there are, I know they're all saved, but obviously the half of them's filled and half of them people aren't here. And obviously people don't steal their book, because I wouldn't leave my book here on the table. I, but it's pretty safe there in China. I, um, and the students said, well, we have respect for them because their seats are there and they saved us so we don't sit there. And I said, but if you want to study and there's no room to sit. And there are 15,000 students, according to them, at Tufts. Okay? So I said, okay, so let's, now that I know about the, uh, I said, if it were me, I would be polite. So if you're not there and I need to study, I would actually borrow your seat. I, I'll push your book to the side, I'll study, and if you come back, I'll just say, sorry, wrong place, put it back, all right? And then I'll move on. So then I asked them, so what do you do in terms of computer? How are computer, uh, well, how, how, how is the computer access here at the university? So they took me to a room also, and there's like a lot of computer, but every computer has somebody on it. And not only that, it's not free. You have a debit card that you put money on, and it's per minute that you're on that computer. And not only that, it is not that you use a lot of jump drive here. We take it for granted. I stick my jump drive in everything a place I go. There you can't do that. If you stick your jump drive in, they told me the first, many students would tell me you will get a virus if you put your jump drive into, in there and then take it back somewhere else. Okay? So that's another thing that was really difficult is those students, there are a lot of students wanting access to it. Of course, they do have some access in the dorm, 
But it's not like here where you have a lot of access and free internet everywhere. I think that's one thing we take for granted that I don't see there, okay? All right, again, I wanted to see the dorm, okay, because I really want to know how students live there compared to here. All right, so if you notice here, each of these is a dorm room, okay, and there's many, and I got, it got cut off here. My student's face is kind of in the picture there, all right? Each of these dorm rooms has six people, all right, and there's no AC. But again, Tianjin is located near the coast, although it was very pleasant when I was there. Um, I think in the morning you can get in the upper 50s, 60s, and at night, I mean, it's very pleasant. It, it, it's just a wonderful weather, and so sometimes it did a couple of days there. It got up into 80, so it got really hot if you're walking across campus, but at night and in the morning, it's very pleasant. Throughout the day, you have this constant wind blowing, so it's very nice. All right, so you, and they don't have AC in these rooms, okay? So there are six students to a room, and of course, you know, the student, you know, hang their clothes, wash it, and hang them up here. So I told him, I said, well, I want to see the inside of the dorm. Because, you know, I've lived as a student before. I want to compare the difference between the American dorms and the Chinese student dorm, okay? Um, I tried to go in the girls' dorm, but they had some security problem that week, and I would have to fill out a whole bunch of paperwork, and I said, you can't go in. So I said, well, how can I see it? So one of my uh, male students, he told me, he said, I'll tell you what, I'll go home, back to my room, I'll take a picture, and I'll email it to you. So here's the next one. So he said, excuse my room. All right, so here's the dorm, <laughs> okay? This is the inside, and of course, there's six guys, all right? So um, you notice there's three beds on the top, and there's three beds on the bottom, okay? And this is where they would sit to study. That, this is their desk, okay? And of course, smoking in China is allowed, so some of my students would complain that, you know, they said they can't study in there because I think in one of my students, the one that has the face that was showing up over here, he said that out of the six people, he's the only one that was a non-smoker and everybody oh. else smoked. So it was really difficult, and he said he can't, he can't sleep because it would be sensitive to smoke. So this is a, I, but otherwise, if you open the window at night, it's very pleasant. And there's no, there's no uh, window unit or anything here, so this, all the air you're going to get through is going to be through that window. But the temperature is so pleasant that it's really nice. Now, it can get really hot. And if it did that, then of course it's going to be very unpleasant. So actually, some of the students told me that what they would do is, even though they work, they go to class on campus, they would go home um, during the weekend or when they can, so that they can, of course, they're kind of. And some of them who come back from the U.S. have gotten spoiled by the air conditioning here. So then they don't, they are less likely to readapt to this environment. Okay, but the student there don't seem to be bothered by it because they're used to the heat. This is the cafeteria, because again, I wanted to see what it's like. So if you notice, in the morning when it's breakfast, there's only one floor right, that's open, because there's less students eating in the morning. Okay? And that could go from dumpling to soup to you know, rice or anything like that. There's a lot of starch in the diet. Right? Um, in the afternoon and in the evening, all three floors would open up. In fact, you can have access to other buildings, too, that would have food. Um, in terms of the get buying the food, they do not take cash, all right, because they have other universities in the surrounding area, and people would, actually, the food at this university is very good, and so other people would come to this university, and if you pay for pay it with cash, they don't know which student is which, and then they can eat on this campus. So what happened is they decided they're going to have this TUS debit card. So to get there, faculty or student, you have to put a certain amount of money on this debit card, and if you want to go, all you have to do is they have these little machines here, you can see right here, all right? Those are machines. If, let's say, I want, and it, food is extremely cheap in China. Hotel also is very reasonable. I think I pay the most is my, probably my tour, okay? But hotel, food, the, of course, the plane ticket, all right? It's very expensive, but anything else, it's very cheap. So they gave me um, about 1,000 yen. And they, with the exchange rate, that's about $150 in US money. And for $150, the whole time I was there, I was trying to use it up, all right? Because there was so much money left. And I told my student, I'm just going to forget it. And he said, why not? The gift to you, just go ahead and use it all up. So he said, I'll help you spend it. So <laughs> we, went, we went to the store, and we went in there. And he said, I said, what do you want? And he said, I like this drink. I like this drink. I said, take it, take it. So we just, we, you know, in the last few days I was there, we just empty that car. OK, because we have that money. If you don't use it, they're just going to return it to the university, go back to the government. So why not spend it, right? That's what he told me. That's the logic. 
So, all right, so what we went through here, and you notice there's all kinds of variety of food. Okay, now Chinese people like spicy food, that's for sure. All right, and so I would go through here, and of course there's no, and you know what's one thing that really, I, I really admire about the people who work in the cafeteria? They're extremely efficient. You think of thousand students going through this for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they process all these people like this, okay? And not only that, you notice there's no line. So when I first started here, I was trying to be polite. So I keep saying, you know, even though I'm in front, I wait for somebody. And I realized after a while that I never get to my food because everybody keeps kind of pushing in. All right, so you have to learn to be a little bit aggressive to get to your food, okay? But otherwise, um, you get your food and there's all kinds of table and you sit down here and eat uh, your meal. Now, no napkins are provided, so we have to bring on napkins because with this much student and the number of uh, the population numbers, you know, it's high. They don't provide napkins, so you need to bring these little napkin packs. And of course, you can see all the students. Of course, they have TV on there for students to watch. This is the group I was with. He, this is a faculty. He's in the bioengineering department, Dr. Liu. He was very helpful to me when I was there. In fact, my debit card didn't work. They put money on there for me, but I couldn't get, my, I couldn't get it to work. And it was on, they had a three-day holiday while I was there. So I couldn't get my car to work, and so therefore, how am I going to eat? They don't take cash, and yet I, I can't use my debit card. So he loaned me his debit card and let me use it. And these are some of the students there. Some of them are master's students. These guys are undergraduate students. Uh, this guy is going to get his PhD. Uh, and some of these are still, they're still undergraduate students. And um, some of them wants to go to the US and kind of experience life in the US. Some of them. Um, like this one, he was very interested after I was there talking to him. Um, he is thinking maybe in the future he wants to visit the U.S. and maybe even come here to do his doctorate, Ph.D., all right? Um, so they were really, really helpful. And I was there for a few weeks, but actually one day um, I ran out of my um, cell phone money. And I couldn't get, I didn't know how to recharge my cell phone uh, card. And these two girls saw me on campus. And I mean, it's just right time because they helped me. Um, to reach, you know, put money back on my cell phone card. So it was uh, really nice. Um, we taught, or at least I taught um, anywhere from each time I teach a class, and usually that's about three times a week, two to three times a week. And it's more informal. Um, in other words, he would set a time where all the graduate student and undergraduate student can show up. It's more like a seminar session. And so the talk would be anywhere um, for about maybe an hour and a half, we'll take a break. We'll meet back for another hour and a half. And if we have a discussion, we can be in there from three hours to four hours. Their classes are much longer. It's not like 50 minutes now, 15 minutes like here. Okay? And this is a picture of the last day I was there. And I just, we, Dr. Liu and I decided to ask the um, Chinese student, what are some questions you have about America or any other thing that we can help you with uh, in terms of education here? And in order, and he decided just to be more fun for students, he's going to buy snacks and buy beverages and can kind of have like a little, you know, student session kind of thing. And they told me that's the first time they get to actually interact with the faculty and get free food. Because they don't do that like here when you get student appreciation day and all these fancy stuff, right? Um, so to them, even though just dry snack, it was a, it was a really great thing. All right, and so um, they, of course, asked me a lot of questions, and so I told them, I asked them, what are some things you are interested about? Oh, what do you think about the, uh, the United States and its education system? Um, <laughs> and uh, they told me, they said, well, the one thing we don't, we, we look at your SAT and stuff, and we don't understand the math is so easy, yet people here find it so difficult. <laughs> I, and I said, well, yes, we do need to repair that, all right, fix that somehow. Um, and again, the science, they, when the students who are taking my biology class at the science here are taught, they got that information there. But the information that we taught here are much more detailed in terms of the process, in, in, in terms of the science. All right? And so I asked them, so what, is, what are some things that you like about America? All right? And they said the one thing that we can say that we really like about America is its creativity. The people are very creative. Because if you think about Steve Jobs, you think about uh, you know, uh, Bill Gates, you got all these people, of course they love the iPad, right? Um, and so they really think American people are very creative, but they, don't, they think that we need to improve on our education system. Okay, so that's the one thing that I found out. Now, they all want to come here and visit the U.S. I, they love it, they love the freedom. 
In fact, you know, and, 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 and the fact that, do you know, for those of you who are undergraduate students, they told me this, when you come to the university on your first year, you choose a major here. You have the ability in the U.S. to change a major if you decide you don't like biology or math or whatever. There, they told me, once you choose your major, unless you're, you are stuck with it from the first year, unless you're in the top 3% of your class, you cannot change your major. And so, again, that was in the news, too. Actually, that was the only American th station that I understand the whole time I was there. Um, and they talk about it. That is why some Chinese students appreciate coming here. It's because of their ability to choose their major. Okay? And so that, that's a really important thing. Uh, and so, of course, there's a lot of, uh, you know, um, serious stuff. So I was there for several weeks. And in between, this is Yu Kun, and some of you may recognize him. I, Yu Ken Chen. I, um, and he is, he just took his GRE, he wants to go to Canada, right? Um, he's a good friend of Yukon, okay? And so they decided they want to show me something outside of the university and of course the food and, uh, and this is a Korean restaurant, right, that they took me to. It's like a barbecue kind of thing and we were in line for like an hour because it was so popular, okay, to get into the restaurant. And of course these are different kind of food. Now, I'm pretty much adventurous, I will try anything. Okay, the only two things I ever say no to um, during this time, I think, and I won't, in, in case some of you are kind of uh, 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 sensitive to that, is I think one time, I think one of my students um, ordered lamb brain and the other one was lamb. I don't eat lamb, so anything associated with lamb, I don't eat. But otherwise, all the food, I try everything at least once. Okay, if I don't like it, I'll stop eating it, but I try everything. And uh, watermelon is very popular in China. It's, you can find it anywhere. Oh, and one thing I forgot to tell you that's really neat about, uh, I don't know if I have a picture up here, let me, um, you notice, um, let's see if I have a picture, I might have passed, no, it's not coming up, so I might have passed it. Underneath those dorm, I, they have little boutique or little um, places, I, again, this is just more cafeteria pictures, I, oh, here, okay, see this, this is the dorm on top, down here, these are shops, all right? They have shops on here, Xerox uh, shop. You can Xerox your paper, right? and you have to pay using that same debit card. It's the same throughout the university. But here, these shops will actually accept money, OK? Um, uh, phone, cell phone shop, uh, snack shop, food shop. So students can go out throughout the day, and there's watermelon, there's nuts, there's all kinds of dry snack or beverages, ice cream, all along here. So students will go across campus, or come down here, and of course, over here, these two over here, that's where the cafeteria is located. Um, this is the only bank that I know of that would exchange money from American money to yen, so that's why I have, that's Bank of China. This is a restaurant that they took me to the first night I was there, and it, again, it's a very beautiful restaurant, okay? Um, and this is the kind of food that you would see here. This is like some, it, it tastes like, I'm not sure what it is, but she's trying to explain it. But it tastes like potato, but you can tell that they, they made it so it looks very beautiful. Right? And this is a veg vegetarian dish because they know that I like veggies, so they order a lot of veggie instead of having a lot of meat. Okay, so here, this is a bean curd, soybean drink in the morning. So you just grab one of these cups, and I, like I said, this thing is probably 50 cents. Okay, so for breakfast with about 2 $3, you can eat for, in $10 in a day, you can be really full. I mean, the food is really cheap. I, and then I went out with some of the students again later on, and they love spicy food, okay? This fish over here was uh, what they call moderately hot. This one is extremely hot, and you can, was ordering this, and you can tell, look at the fish down here, and there's a pile of red chili pepper. And it was so funny because he took one bite, and he it was like he couldn't continue because it was so hot. Okay, so th they love hot food. This was the day before graduation, senior graduation, and the students were celebrating, so they do, Chinese people love to sing. Here we're much more inhibited about singing out loud, unless you're karaoke, okay? Um, but Chinese people love to sing, and so they had some faculty and some student out here singing the night, be uh, that was uh, the last night before graduation to celebrate the last day there. This is Yu Ken's mom, okay? I really was very grateful for her help and her husband 
she, um, her husband is a military colonel, um, and I didn't know this, but they have a lot of respect for high-ranking officer, and she, um, they had um, a chauffeur. So as soon as, and his home is in Herbei, and I hope I say that right. If you're Chinese and I'm saying it wrong, please correct me. All right, uh, which is about 600 kilometer from Tianjin, and I think it's about a six-hour ride or something, uh, train ride from Tianjin. Okay, um, and when we got there, I mean, you, I just feel like I was treated like a queen because they pick us up. You know, we have to carry a lot of stuff, and they don't have escalator like here, so I have to yank a lot of my luggage up and down. When we got there, as soon as we got to the uh, place where the uh, chauffeur was, he was driving her around. He picked up and do everything. So we are constantly, if, if it was raining, he actually pulled out an umbrella and put it over our head. In fact, you know, it was amazing. So they really, we had a lot of nice treatment. And this is the kind of food that we have pretty much every day. It's almost like a 20-some course meal. Okay, so you see this rotating uh, place here. Um, the food just come out. Appetizer comes out first. And sometime during the meal, you have at least four different types of soup. All right. And of course, they're one of the tradition is uh, to toast the guest of honor. So, um, and one of the wine that they have is about, if you guys know, the, the, it's very strong. The, I think the most diluted I have was 40%, and the most concentrated was 60% proof. Okay, and it burns all the way down. All right. And not only that, they toast the guest of honor, so they would have a fish on this thing here. And they would rotate this around, and if the fish, and they leave the fish head on there, and if the fish rotate to where you are sitting, then that means you got a drink, and it's in a little shot glass. All right? The only problem is I can't handle, handle my alcohol, even with a beer, let alone with 60% proof. All right? So I, my student and I can, you know, he speaks English, so he, or he's my translator. So the rest of the people, he had to translate Chinese to them and English to me. <coughs> so he just said, just sip it a little, little bit at a time. Because they got him drunk one day. <laughs> all right? And so he, he, his face turned all red, so he told me, he said, just sip a little bit. You don't have to drink a lot. So I tried that. But every time the fish head rotates to me, I have to take a sip. And even when you take a little sip, eventually it's going to hit. Right? And so after a while, I, when that fish head comes to me, I'm starting to think I'm starting to hate fish. All right? <laughs> because, I mean, and um, so, but that was, that was a very interesting experience, um, and I truly enjoy it. And I, I was with them for about two days. Okay. All right, so here again, just pictures, just so you, to show you how. And they t the one thing about the Chinese I really enjoy is that they eat their meal. They're very social. So a meal is not just by yourself in front of a TV. You eat with other people and you converse. Here we have more antisocial habit, which I do have it. You go home and you sit in front of the TV. All right? There, they eat together and they talk. So, of course, you eat slower too, hopefully. Okay. All right, so now that's the first half, if, you know, um, in terms of the student and the university. Um, and again, I still keep in touch with a lot of them, and they still email me if they want to come to the U.S. or they have questions about graduate school. Uh, I still keep in touch with them, and some of them invite me back to other part of China. Uh, for the future, so they, do, they email me, like in fact New Year, Chinese New Year, they email me and just say, say Happy New Year. So the next thing I it did was uh, during one of the weekend, uh, my, one of my Chinese students lives in Beijing, and he's back there now preparing, uh, studying for his GRE, thinking of coming back here for his PhD. And so um, he took me to the Great Wall of China, okay? Uh, so the Great Wall of China, you guys know, is the, one of the greatest wonder of the world. Uh, it was built during the Qin Dynasty, but it actually was repaired mostly during the Min Dynasty. All right? And the Great Wall is also, even though it's a humongous structure, it's also known as the um, longest cemetery on earth. Because you know it's history. A lot of people died to build that wall. In fact, a lot of people were f compelled to service to build the wall. Okay? And they found, they, the legend has it that out of 10 people that are compelled to go to build that wall, three might make it home. Seven would die from either starvation, exhaustion, um, exposure for, to the element. Okay, so there's a, a, a and again, it, it was built, uh, started during the Qin um, Dynasty. Um, it was listed as the, by the World Heritage, uh, as a World Heritage by UNESCO, which is United Nations Education Science Cultural Organization in 1987. Okay, 
Uh, and it winds up and down, and I'll show you a picture of it, down across the desert, grassland mountain and plateau. Now, the Chinese believe in feng shui, okay? And you guys know that's just the natural flow of things. They don't like to break things up. So instead of you breaking through, it will go with the mountains, okay, through a certain plane. Right? And not only that, it curves, okay? Um, it doesn't, it's not a straight line. So the Great Wall, depending where you look at it, again, it's not built all at one time. Most of us think the Great Wall is built in one piece. No, because during Qin was the uh, first emperor of China, and what he did was he unite um, seven warring um, states at that time to become what is China. Okay? And those pieces of wall were built by different warring states, and what he does is he built a little bit more and he would connect them. So they're not built at one time. And there's also a myth that most people say you can see the Great Wall from the moon. That is also a myth. You can enhance the image to see it, but you don't actually see it from the moon. But they, that myth carries because everybody keeps continue to spread that myth. But it's not true. You don't see it from the moon. All right? So it has a history of more than 2,000 years. Okay? And so the wall would get, you know, need repair with time. And I think during Dong Xiaoping is when he really renovated the, uh, the wall to make it it is now. And the wall used to be associated in a, before the 19th and 20th century, the wall is associated with uh, military defeat, because I'll, I'll tell you why in a second, I, and with oppression by the feudal lord. So it's not until the 20th century that the Chinese people start see, seeing it as a national pride. It's a symbol of China, not until later on. Okay? So if, if you go to China, you can't go home without seeing a great wall, because that's just crazy. All the dignitaries, Nixon went over there in 1972. Everybody sees the Great Wall. President Reagan was over there to see the Great Wall. All dignitary has, you know, they go there. That's to give homage to China. These are my students. I have them all in biology. In fact, uh, he is the one that showed me Beijing. That's how. Some of you may know him. This is Peter, Leanne. Uh, Peter was on a different, with a different GSW group. Leanne and Beth. Beth is in my biology right now. Leanne is a biology major, getting close to finish. So they're all biology major. And we were at the Great Wall. This is the Great Wall. So you can see it curve. Okay. Why did they build the Great Wall? I love the history behind all this, okay? And I learned all these history because it fascinates me. They don't build the Great Wall on a straight path, you know, because again, the flow. And they believe that they built that Great Wall to keep out the nomadic tribe from the north, all right? And so it's, it's a way for them to keep out what they call the civilized China, the fertile, uh, you know, fertile China, and the uncivilized China, which is going to be <coughs> the people outside of it, like the barbarian, the nomads. Okay? Um, and not only that, the reason why it's crooked, is it, it's kind of like not in a straight line, is because they think the, uh, that the devil can actually cross a straight line. If you build it crooked like this, it can't go across a crooked line or turn a corner. And that's the reason why the Great Wall is like this. And not only the feng shui, if you go up like that, um, you're following the mountain, you're following nature, you're not going against it. Okay? But, uh, again, it, it, and of course you have all these people standing here, I, and they would bring lunch, and you can climb. I mean, if you have a lot of stamina, you can go all the way to the top I, of some of these places. But of course the wall is long, so you can only climb a certain section of the wall. Okay, and you can bring your food, and if you get tired, you can sit at one of these steps and just take a break, eat your food, and continue on. Leanne and Beth, I think, went all the way, keep going, 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 and the rest of us got exhausted, so we turned around and went, took the easy trail coming back down. So there's another picture of the wall. I have a lot of pictures of the wall, so you can see how magnificent it is. It is amazing. Yeah, and it's, again, it's built, and again, think of a lot of people, in fact, died to build this wall, okay? And now it becomes um, a national pride for China, but before that, it because, oh, I forgot to tell you that one significant point. This wall was supposed to pay, protect them from the nomadic tribes, but twice in history, they were invaded by first Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan, okay? And they dominate China for about 100 years. Then the second time it was by the Manchu. So that wall didn't, didn't protect them from outsider like they expected it to be. That's why they see it as a sign of military defeat, because they didn't protect them from that. Okay. 
And of course, you can have ways to go down that you can pay for that, and you can go down the uh, uh, sliding car if you don't want to walk down. The, you know, I walked down the whole time. I didn't want to go sliding car, but you can do that. All right, next place we want to see is Tenement Square. Okay? And there's a picture of Chairman Mao, who is the uh, father or founder of the People's Republic of China. He is also a Chinese Communist revolutionary okay, in 1949, and he ruled China for about from 1949 to about 1976 when he died. He was, I think, 83 years old. Okay. And so, of course, most of us know it is the site of the uh, Tiananmen Square. It's the site of the student protest on June the 3rd, 1989. Um, of course, the protests are anger, um, are anger by the widespread corruption and calling for uh, democracy. Okay. And so the government really reacts strongly to this, and many, many people die. And they say it could be hundreds of thousands of, of people. There's just some picture of the, some of the uh, things that I see at the Great Wall. Okay. I'm sorry, the Tenement Square. Then, of course, we went to see Forbidden City, which is, again, lying at the center of Beijing. I, and this is the largest palace museum um, where 24 emperors used to live. Okay. And it was built. Um, during the Ming and the Qing dynasty. There's two parts to this Forbidden City, and I'll show you a picture of it. Okay? The southern section, or the outer court, is when the emperor rules, where he does his business. Right? And then, of course, the northern section, or the inner court, is where the emperor lived with his family. All right? So you have all these rooms, and they're huge. Okay? And I think this is, again, at the time, I don't know, but I looked this up, and I think this is called the Hall of Supreme Harmony. It's the centerpiece of the Forbidden Palace. It is it's beautiful. It's, the splendor of it is amazing. Okay? Um, so all these people would go up to here, and if you want to see the inside, there are so many people there that you have to kind of like have to push yourself in to look inside these buildings. And they have a room where the emperor sleeps, a room where he does his business, a room where he bathes. There's a room for everything. Okay? And there's millions and millions of people coming through here. And see, here's a close-up where you can see the inside. All right, and that's the inside. This is where he would sit. And you cannot go past this point. And I don't know what. I tried to ask people what does that say. And some of them said that's old Chinese uh, character, and they can't read it. Or at least they can't understand what that said. Or some of my Chinese students. This is where they have students who used to come and take exams. To, and if they do well, then they will serve the, the, the emperor. And this is where they would, this is like dorm for the student at the time, and this is where they would stay. <coughs> All right, another thing that you got here about is the Olympic Park. All right, again, it's constructed in 2008 for the Summer Olympic. And so we were there just for one night, and so there's Olympic Park. Okay, and they had a concert going on that night, and of course there's the pool, right? And there's a concert, and it was going on in that, uh, um, structure right there uh, the night that we were there. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. And let me go ahead and show you, since it's such a Bay High part, if you have anything else, you are welcome to ask, the, uh, ask me. But let me get, because that's a lot into that short amount of time. It's really hard to tell you a lot. All right. So let me skip to this part. All right. This is, um, if you hear about the Terracotta Warriors in Xi'an, China. Okay, uh, you can't, to me, I would recommend that you go see this. And there's three pits that's been found. They excavated this pit, right? and there are a lot of terracotta warriors. And again, this is an army that's built by the Qin uh, emperor to pro actually protect him after he died. And they believe in the afterlife, and he wanted to believe in immortality. And so they would excavate all these. There's 8,000 total terracotta warriors, but they only ex excavate a few of them. Because why? The reason why is I'll see you show you on this picture here. There are infant, uh, uh, infantry, there's chariots, there's uh, archer, there's general, all these different figuring. Right? The only problem is when you take, you dig them up, and of course, they have to be numbered, and they have some of them lose their head or lose some parts, so you have the archaeologists have to be reconnect them, make sure they go to the right soldier. Right? But if you notice, they used to be, when they were buried in those tombs, they have these colors. But when they excavate them, they would lose that color within minutes to weeks. So until they can find a way to preserve those colors, they will not excavate the rest of the terracotta warriors. 
Okay, and I got a whole bunch of thing about the. There's a, a lot of beautiful th that technology that's amazing. There's a mystery about how this is built. I don't have time for that right now. But it to me, this is one of the most amazing things that 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 you the, the science of behind I am, the paint that they built. They have found it is so unique that China created it uh, during that time, and the technology is out of that time because how can they create that kind? And those paint was analyzed by physicists and they found that those paints can actually make better superconductor. So what does that mean? You can make faster computer using the, that, the, whatever's in that paint. Right? You can make uh, it, your electricity bill less, lower. You can make train to rise faster using the, whatever's in that paint, the composition of the chemical, that, the, the, what's making up that paint. And uh, so of course they analyze that in a physics lab and I read about that and uh, again as a scientist it fascinates me. So, and there's a lot more of how, and those figure right there, they are not all alike. They're all unique. Every one of them has a different facial expression. So they were not built from a mold. And if you think about it, it was built in 10 years. They had 10 years before the emperor died and he ordered them to build it in 10 years. So in 10 years, 8,000. That means you build 700 to 800 in a year. Do you know right now if they replicate this and using a mold that can only make about um, uh, is it once a month, all right, so 12 a year. So how in the world do they get 700 in a year? And not only, they didn't make it from a mold. They manually make it, at least from the archaeological evidence. It's not made by a mold. So how was this accomplished? Again, that, that's more than I can tell you right now because we don't have the time. But to me, it's a very, it, it, it's, it's amazing. Okay? It holds a lot of mystery. And again, another thing that if you live in China, you have to see that. And a city, even though it's very traditional, a lot of history, there's a very modern element to it. In fact, some of the hotel looks like we're in Hollywood. So it's a combination of modern and tradition. And some of my Chinese students have never been there. And I, I highly recommend that you go if you are from China and you haven't seen it. Okay, so again, there's the archer. And I went to a dinner theater. You have like 10 different kinds of dumpling, dessert, and savory dumpling. And of course, they have folk dance where they have, you know, like the concubine would dance, you know, <coughs> a dance for the emperor, uh, dance for improving harvest, right? Um, and of course, I got a lot of Buddhist temple, but again, I, we don't have time to go through all of that. I just want to uh, show you a few of the, my um, thing. And if you are interested in more information, do you feel free to ask me, okay? Oh, by the way, if you want to see some of that, I brought uh, my Terracotta Warrior uh, figurine. And this is a book that was signed by that farmer that, that he was the founder of the Terracotta Warrior. He signed the book for me. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I, it's hard to follow the yeah. I've seen people just push people Well, Dr. Stahl said don't say much about her, but she has an excellent background and PhD in English from Florida State University, and she was at Chang Shu um, University this past Institute of Technology this past summer. And she's done a lot of international travel with Habitat and so forth. And, um, has been very active on campus too. She was director of university convocations, which is very difficult. But anyhow, um, she will now give her presentation. Okay. Um. Yeah, let me. Okay. Well, that was a tour de force, and I stayed in one place. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I would like to start at a gate. This is um, a gate that leads to a uh, Buddhist uh, temple, the only one that uh, actually I was able to visit in Changshu. Uh, the reason I have this gate here is gates are an incredibly important part of the architecture 
uh, and the, the landscape of China. And you will notice that this gate has a big centerpiece and it has two outside uh, areas. This is a fairly traditional structure. Uh, one of the uh, things that you will notice in some of the pictures and one of the things I observed is the repetitiveness of patterns and of styles. And uh, that is one of the hallmarks of Chinese architecture. Um, feng Shui is an important feature and um, the things that are designed uh, are meant to enhance the harmony of the place. So, the Republic, the People's Republic of China is in mainland China. Uh, we need to keep in mind that excludes Hong Kong and Macau. Um, one of the meanings for uh, China means middle country, but tongue in cheek, uh, it's old land and hard work. <laughs> All right, so we will begin with the big city of Changshu. Um, and this is a picture on a clear day. Um, my lungs were not uh, highly impressed or cooperative uh, with the air uh, that I was breathing. Uh, and you can see that even on a clear day, it's not uh, Georgia blue and it's uh, not necessarily sunshiny. Um, what I want you to see is the uniformity of the buildings there. Uh, many of them are quite high and um, are uh, rather impressive. Uh, with how close they are together. I stayed at Changshu Institute of Technology. Uh, it is now a 50-year-old institution. And uh, this is one of the features. Um, I liked uh, this picture because we have both uh, the clock there uh, that is, of course, uh, a keeper of time, as well as the compass uh, that they have used as a sundial. Um, and uh, it is, uh, I think, to me, representative of the mission of uh, Changshu Institute of Technology, which is technology. Um, but this was a gift. Uh, I was interested to see that uh, alums in uh, China behave the way ours do. And this was a gift from an alum that had become very successful. So for the 50th anniversary, uh, this uh, sculpture was presented. Uh, to the Institute. Here is another view of it. Um, and uh, of course, uh, clearly it was meant to be a fountain, but the fountain wasn't working when I was there. Um, you see in the background uh, one of the university buildings. Um, the, this particular campus is considered the uh, main campus. There was an older campus that was in the downtown historic area, and there is now an east campus. Um, the velocity with which uh, China can construct buildings is an utter astonishment to me. Uh, these things can go up in a couple of months. Um, they also have an enormous kind of uniformity. Um, it is a certain kind of architectural style. And for the life of me, I couldn't find in my notes to tell you what it is. But uh, there is uh, a certain. Uh, reflection of, uh, of Russian uh, architecture in it. Uh, this was one of my favorite buildings on campus. It is the library. Uh, and uh, this library uh, is unusual in its shape. Uh, you see the landscaping, meticulous landscaping, uh, very effectively done on the weekends by farmers that come in to earn extra uh, wages. Um, on the weekends, they're all uh, working very hard. Uh, unfortunately, I have a green thumb, and so uh, one Sunday morning I was out doing my green thumb stuff when the workers came and looked at me strangely. Why was I um, deadheading the roses? And so I decided to behave myself and stop. <laughs> All right, here's another view of the library. And uh, what I found uh, intriguing about this is depending on where you were standing, um, it reflected two kinds of features. It can either be a mountain, which was an important and is an important feature of Changshu, um, and you'll see the mountain momentarily, or it is a boat. Uh, and you can see that that almost looks like a, a <coughs> smokestack from a, a, from a boat. Well, this reflects both of the features of Changshu. 
in that uh, both the mountain uh, is an important feng shui feature, but also it is on the Yangtze River Delta. In this particular area, there's an enormous amount of history. It was uh, close to the location of the Japanese invasion, which was uh, very uh, effectively defended um, and uh, fought. And uh, so they want to commemorate this um, with the with this building. This was one of the very few days there was actually enough sunshine to make this uh, very lovely picture, uh, the reflection on the windows there. All right, so this is Yushan. Shan means mountain, uh, so you don't say Yushan Mountain, it's just Yushan. Uh, this uh, particular picture is from the highest part of the pagoda that I decided to uh, climb, and uh, in the trad Typical tradition, at the end of each one of the pagoda arms on the roofs, we have a little bell. Um, but uh, this mountain is a, a rather remarkably big structure right there in the middle of the city. Again, you can see uh, a clear day is not necessarily a clear day. All right, so here's the pagoda. The picture was... Ah, the picture was taken from up there where I dared myself to go. Um, so feng shui is a design concept that means to create a certain, as I said earlier, harmony, but it has to balance things out. Uh, there was a lake, there was the mountain, and according to uh, tradition, there had to be some kind of a structure to balance those out. So this pagoda was built. Uh, and it has, because of its significance, survived um, to uh, continue standing there. Um, so besides the um, historic value, of course, it has, um, it's beautiful. Uh, it, at the bottom has um, an image that uh, you'll see uh, a little bit later. Uh, the... Uh, tips of the roof, of course, all have to go up, and if you look carefully, you can see uh, the little bells. On the day that I chose to go up there, it was extraordinarily windy, and the higher I went, the more I was uh, wondering whether I should be up there. Uh, I was the only one at the very top, and uh, so as soon as I took the picture, I left again. All right, <laughs> uh, not to show off my prowess, and <laughs> but... Um, in the back, you can see the rather greenish building is the gym. Uh, the, the dormitories are right in back of that. There's, they're all the same. Uh, but this is the exercise pavilion. Um, and um, as you can see, I was trying to figure out how to learn to row the Yangtze Delta. Uh, <laughs> here's another picture of uh, lifting weights. Uh, and right to uh, the upper part there, that's, uh, that's the lake. Uh, at this particular part of the university. All right, so I want to show you a couple of options for shopping. Uh, this is a, I have to look at the word, otherwise I, I can't say it, a hutong. Uh, this is, these are the smaller streets. This is where you can go without getting run over, actually. And uh, you notice the laundry hanging. Um, and these go from one area of the neighborhood to the other. It's sort of uh, like a web work and you have to learn how to uh, drop a ball of thread so you can get yourself back out again. Um, this particular hutong uh, led to the market in Changshu. They're open from daylight until dark. Um, you can barter and uh, decide what you're going to pay. Um, as Dr. Tu said, watermelons are uh, extremely popular. They are powered by organic fertilizer. All right, here are the eggs and the meat. And you can uh, look around. Uh, there's quail eggs back there. Uh, so you just uh, decide what it is that you want and ask for it and carry it home. I did buy eggs, but I didn't buy any of that meat. <coughs> The market is a little bit crowded, so this particular hutong you can see is, uh, is fairly crowded. Somebody did uh, ride a motorcycle through there. Um, the wares are uh, put out, and uh, 
you know, a part of the tradition is you need to make small talk before you uh, go on and make your purchase. Um, for the adventurous, we can have frogs. For the even more adventurous, you can have eel. They look better on the plate after somebody else has cooked them. And <laughs> here we have peppers, ginger, and garlic, and green tea. And those are all preventative measures so that if you eat too many of those frogs and eels, you have a way to preserve your dignity. This is the tea shop. I like this little guy. This is the dries, you know, the beans and all of the, the dry vegetables. All right, so then here are the big box stores. And uh, this is one of the main areas downtown. Uh, I, if you look carefully, you can find the Colonel. You found the Kentucky Colonel yet? There's music streaming from all the stores to entice you to come. Uh, here's another view of that same uh, big area. Did you find Pizza Hut? Pizza. All right. <laughs> all right. Uh, I found this fascinating. I sort of had to stop and watch these guys put this billboard up. Um, beautiful lady with jade. And... Uh, I was really wanting to bring some of that jade home with me until I priced it. So, a couple of people on the street, the street sweeper and the recycler, obviously are not going to be buying jade either. This is actually a very small collection. Uh, sometimes the street sweepers get as tall as the lamp, just piling things on top, and you wonder how they're going to negotiate the traffic. The streets are very clean uh, because there's someone watching uh, constantly. Any little thing that gets dropped is cleaned right away. So my thoughts on the distribution of wealth is that there is a great deal of luxury. I saw very fancy houses. I saw extremely fancy cars. I saw clothing that was way out of my price range. Uh, and then I saw the abject living conditions, the jerry-rigged bikes and pedicabs, and some people that I saw almost every day wore the same clothes the entire three weeks I was there. So clearly there is a huge uh, shift and divide. Um, I consider it a highly industrialized country, but I think for many uh, we still have prevailing conditions uh, that are um, not good. Um, it is easy to identify migrant workers and social and racial minorities on the bus. Um, and um, you can uh, see that they're also not necessarily um, held in high esteem by their fellows. Um, the one American thing I gave in to was Starbucks because after about three weeks I was having a hard time. <laughs> um, Green tea was as much as I could have after three weeks, so I went to Starbucks. Um, they know the recipe, and they can make it uh, quite well. That uh, in back of the Starbucks is actually in uh, <coughs> Parkinson's, which is an extremely high-end department store. There is a grocery store, a high-end grocery store in the basement. All right, so uh, four things that I focused on while I was in Changshu is the Xingfu Temple, which is an ancient Buddhist monastery, uh, the Pagoda Park, of which you've already seen the Pagoda, uh, the City Wall, which is not the, the big wall, but it was the only wall I had at my disposal, so I walked it, and then we have Yushan and its tombs. Um, education has always been a highly prized uh, thing in China. Um, it did not matter what class you were born to. If you could pass the imperial examinations, uh, you could uh, get a job. Uh, this is a, um, a commemorative uh, piece in uh, Yushan Park, and uh, it honors the great sage and many of his students. In fact, many of his students are buried on the mountain on the way up. So as I said, uh, some of the structures really represent and repeat one another. This is a minor person's tomb. Uh, so everywhere you go along the pathway up, straight up the mountain, you'll see this. 
I wanted to show you, again, here's another one of those bridges, uh, excuse me, uh, gates, and you see the same uh, structure. One of the other features of many of the gates is that they have a lion uh, on either side. On the right side would be the male lion. He has his paw on the world. And on the left side is the female lion. She has her paw uh, holding down a lion cub. And uh, the, these two are usually paired. Uh, they're called shishis. Um, Westerners are rather uncomplimentary, called them uh, dogs, but they're not dogs. They're uh, more dignified. This is a, a, a tomb all the way at the top of Yushan Mountain. Um, so the principles, the architectural principles that we see in many of these historic buildings are 4,000 years old, uh, or the culture at least is 4,000 years old. We'd say about 3,000 years. All of these things are made by hand and fashioned together without nails. Uh, so there is an enormous amount of uh, ingenuity and artistry that goes into the making of these. Um, the uh, yellow color is always um, a nod to uh, either things imperial or things Buddhist. Um, so uh, you pay attention uh, to those uh, colors. From that uh, point, uh, you can see a lake. Um, that um, is to the north part of the mountain. Um, actually, it's possible to go up and down and come out on the other side. I was a little unsure which bus I was supposed to take home, and I wasn't all that adventurous. Another feature that uh, is um, important on this mountain is uh, the Chinese used to, or still do actually, prefer burying their um, family members on heights. Uh, so this, uh, there's a, a very extensive cemetery there. Uh, this is at the entrance of the cemetery, and it is uh, where uh, incense and uh, offerings can be brought uh, on um, particular celebratory days. So here is, uh, I, I felt um, that it would be entirely too uh, disrespectful on my part to go into the cemetery, so I just did a zoom uh, from uh, the gate. Um, and interesting, they're very well, very crowded together, uh, but all of those are you know, traditional tombstones, the way we would have them. All right, we're back on the pagoda here. I think this one is a little, this, this might be the highest one. Um, and you can see the imposition that this, this mountain uh, has uh, on the city. Uh, one of the important things that I need to point out to you is that while you've seen taller buildings on other pictures, within the two mile radius of the pagoda, no um, building is allowed to be higher than the pagoda. So this is uh, not only in respect uh, to you know, the old building, but also uh, just uh, to make sure that it becomes or remains the center point. This is uh, looking down to the street uh, from one of the levels of the pagoda. Um, so you can see some of the uh, roof work. Uh, these are all part of the older houses. Uh, right outside that gate is a wonderful dumpling maker who, for the right price, will give you a bag full that you can carry through the streets and eat. Um, during the Cultural Revolution, unfortunately, many things were destroyed. Um, and so in an attempt to reclaim some of the lost um, art, some of the lost um, uh, uh, oh, what, what, I'm at a loss for word, the statues, uh, what they have done is this is near a bus stop area. They have uh, made these planks uh, with the uh, heads of these uh, sages on top, and so there's a, a re, uh, an attempt to reincorporate uh, the history into um, the culture. All right, so uh, Changshu is an, a very ancient city. It has records all the way to 4,000 years, uh, and they have invested in a huge amount of money uh, to go on and rebuild things, and one of the things that they have done is to rebuild uh, the uh, wall. 
So this is uh, the eastern end of the wall. Um, there is not a noticeable gate here uh, because it uh, runs right up uh, to the street. Something else that uh, I found uh, puzzling as well as disconcerting, uh, because Changshu is known as the garden city of that area, um, the uh, folks that make decisions have decided there must be a great deal of transplanting. So they, if they take these huge trees that ordinarily we would never transplant and uh, go on and top them out and bring them in. Those are fairly recently planted there, and uh, uh, you know we hope that they live, but uh, that's how they're going to go on and make it a garden city is by taking huge trees and putting them there. All right, here's the way up the wall, um, and um, it was a fairly steep climb. This is the uh, central gate. A uh, much narrower feature, so it doesn't have the side uh, gates to it. Uh, up in the top there is a museum. Uh, uh, this is a part of the side. And then you can see uh, the downward uh, trot. Uh, this next gate is the western gate and uh, actually goes over one of the major streets. A shot back so you can see that I really did work a little bit. And <laughs> There it is. This is one of the main streets that goes uh, to one of the major schools. You see, again, um, the pension for, for artistry and repetition, because all of these are just uh, you know, designs that have been um, placed there, obviously for grab control, uh, but you'll see many of these same in other places. There is a an enormous amount of reverence on the part of the people. And while there aren't churches or altars everywhere, there are some that have been sanctioned. Xingfu Temple, because of its ancient uh, history, has been, and uh, so uh, people can go there uh, to go on and worship, and they do. Uh, this is a particularly important uh, statue. Um, and um, one of my uh, hosts uh, explained to me that many people come here to pray uh, in order to conceive a child. So there is one, uh, one at uh, the, the pagoda as well as one at the temple. Um, this would be the outer court of the temple before you go in. And uh, as a part of your ticket to go into the temple, you get uh, some incense sticks, you get candles, and then uh, you, you say uh, your prayers facing into the four directions and uh, plant uh, your sticks. As you can see, makes uh, quite a show. I found it curious that uh, in China people have the same habit as we have, except we toss money into the fountains. <laughs> so, uh, there are quite a few of these structures around in the temple grounds, and people just plant coins so they'll balance there. And nobody takes them, and just there. Here is another altar, a Xingfu temple. It has many different little pavilions, and each one has a place of reverence. So I'm showing you now a marketplace shrine. This is sort of a, uh, an ad lib, as it were. Um, so this is the same thing if you can't get to the temple and pay your way in, uh, right in back of a, a little alleyway. Um, I thought this was one of the places where they set off firecrackers because, at least in Changshu, firecrackers every morning uh, were derogere. And uh, I thought one morning actually that uh, the firecracker place had blown up because it was so big and spectacular. And I thought, gee, it's not even the 4th of July. Um, so here they can come. Uh, you can see all the ashes. They say their prayers, uh, light the candles. But this is in the middle of a, of a little shopping area. Again, a view down from the pagoda. So you can see this is a fairly traditional uh, middle, medieval uh, Chinese city structure well-preserved. 
So replication and imitation are a very important part. You can see it in buildings, in parks, and in gardens. Uh, the only place I didn't see any replication, replication uh, was students and young professionals, and their clothing combinations uh, caused a great deal of bemusement. Uh, the only thing I didn't see was uh, fishnet stockings and later hosen put together. Uh, but um, they, uh, the creativity in clothing was very apparent um, in Changshu, but we have to keep in mind that Changshu is one of the centers of, um, of the um, clothing industry. There are literally thousands of shops. I, I took this just because it's pretty. It, on the other side is a place where uh, more incense is burnt. It's just a nice little corner. Um, I, I thought the colors were pretty and the shapes. So here you can see the tallest buildings are fairly far off into the distance. And the tower holds its court there in the middle of the city. And turn it over to you. Most people are familiar with Dr. Smedra. He's an agricultural economist. And he's uh, been here about 10 years, professor of economics and uh, the director of studies abroad program. In the last four years, he's traveled in China extensively and taught at two or three universities. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Smedra to the program. So we'll do this quickly because we only have like 10 minutes. Um, but you know, that's okay. Uh, and I, I wanted the experience that Dr. Stauff had. We were both in the same city and I didn't see any of that stuff, except for like Parkinson's Mall. <laughs> um, let me quickly put in a, a bit of an advertisement for study abroad. We have a Bulgaria program that is going this year. Uh, we'd like to have uh, some more students if you're interested. Please see me right after the presentation. I have some brochures. Um, we're excited that uh, we're going again this year. We went last in 2009, and uh, we're excited to go again. And if you'd like to uh, have a, an entryway into Eastern Europe uh, for hardly any money at all, it's, it's half the price of Western Europe, uh, please see me after the, the presentation. And OK. so. Dr. Stauff and I were in the same place, Changshu Institute of Technology. I was there in December when it was cold. This is my fifth time to China, if we include Taiwan. And Chinese people think that Taiwan is part of China. And probably sometime in the future, it will be part of China. So my fifth time, uh, the first three times were as a tourist. Uh, the last two times, last year I was in Ningbo at Ningbo University of Technology to teach. And this year I was at Changshu um, to teach, and I taught. Um, I counted 28 hours of lectures uh, to students, and you'll see a little bit of that. First off, the city really quick. When I travel, I don't really go to um, uh, architectural uh, places or cultural places. I just want to see how people live. And, you know, on my foot travel through Changshu, uh, this, uh, this is a neighborhood that's very close to the university. Here's another one that's closer to downtown in a big pedestrian mall. And this is kind of what I'm interested in. I want to see how people live their lives in different parts of the world. This is construction right outside the, the gates of the university. They were putting in a, um, a viaduct, an overpass. Uh, and uh, they were sinking in. Here's a, a, a driller uh, putting cores down and uh, uh, building up uh, pillars for the, for the highway. And all of China, most of China, uh, especially now in the 
places outside of Beijing and Shanghai are essentially construction areas. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of construction. There's a tremendous amount of um, demolition, and which is unfortunate. And, but the United States went through the same thing in the 1960s. They called it urban renewal and knocked down most of the old parts of cities in the U.S. to build ugly 1960s and 1970s architecture. And, and the cities that that avoided that now have these in the U.S. now have these beautiful core old buildings, kind of like what America's has here. Um, but the Chinese are doing the same thing, and uh, it's unfortunate. This is uh, Yushan Park, which is right around uh, Yushan Mountain. Uh, this was in December again, and on a sunny day, which again was unusual, the mountains in the background there. Uh, again, part of the park, a uh, very lovely place, and, and everybody, I was going to say Chinese people, but everybody in the world, if you're living in an urban area, you value uh, trees and, and water and bridges, and, uh, uh, and the people in China do the same. Here's uh, the same uh, gate to this wall in, uh, in, in, uh, at Yushan Park uh, coming up the mountain. And here's the other end of it. Starbucks Cafe, we kind of gravitate to the same place. <laughs> Although I didn't wait for three weeks drinking green tea. I mean, I, I knew people told me that there were two Starbucks, and I found them both in the first two days that I was there. <laughs> this, this is one uh, that is in the, the Hung Long Mall, which is Parkinson's, and here's the building. This is a, a big mall-type structure. Parkinson's is the name of the department store that takes up the first like, couple floors, and then uh, there are other shops in here. So you can see the city is uh, very modern, just like uh, many other uh, small cities. Uh, Changshu is two million people, which is considered to be a small city in China. Uh, this is my favorite place, the RT Mart. It's uh, kind of like a Walmart. Uh, and I took the number four bus out here every other day to shop. And I had bags, and I would come back with my provisions for the first a week, and then I kind of explored a little bit more uh, on the number four bus and, and walking also. This is the parking lot, lots of scooters. I think probably 20 years ago this would all have been bicycles, but now it's scooters. And, and the issue here is 99% of the scooters in China are electric, and you can't hear them. You can't hear them coming up behind you, <laughs> which, which is a significant problem. You know, a motor scooter with a, with a combustion engine, you can hear a mile away, but these things are silent. And they're dangerous. And um, I think there's legislation to put noise into some of these scooters so people, could, pedestrians, can hear them coming. Um, Jitneys, uh, this was a five yuan ride. These folks were parked outside the gate of the university, a five yuan to go into the center city. The bus was one yuan, uh, which was, what is that, 16 cents, something like that, 17. So I always took the bus because I'm too cheap to actually take a. Uh, a little jitney. KFC, again, they're, they're all over China. I think they're more in China than there are here in the United States. It was Christmas time, even though uh, the Christian population in China is pretty much minimal. Um, but people enjoyed the, this whole notion of uh, Christmas and, uh, and uh, kind of getting in the swing of uh, Western celebrations, which again is unfortunate. This was a, a, a kind of a, a shopping street off one of the main drags close to Parkinson's Mall. And it was all women's boutiques, women's clothes, and uh, kind of high-end stuff. Here's looking in the other direction. And when I'm in China, I look for like quiet places because most places aren't all that quiet. And here is, a, I went into a police compound. In this building, and maybe the, the Chinese folks that are here can tell me exactly what that lettering says, but this was a very pretty pagoda-like structure uh, within a police compound. Uh, working barges on the waterways uh, in the city. And the city is, is essentially uh, all water, river, rivers and lakes. And it's a very beautiful place. It was beautiful in <coughs> December. It was cold. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Here's kind of what, not old China, not ancient China, but pre-revolutionary um, pre China probably looked like. Old buildings, this beautiful old bridge with its three arches. Um, and here's, uh, yeah, again, again, Dr. Soft talked about the, the uh, garment industry in Changshu. People told me that it was the most uh, productive um, city to produce uh, clothes for China and also for export. 
And because clothes are pretty light, this guy had uh, clothes stacked to the ceiling. And it looks like a, a, a tricycle, but actually they're, they're, most of these are motorized. So people aren't actually pedaling. I didn't see too many of those. And here's the muse uh, for the textile industry. And so she's got a bolt of fabric here. And I suppose all the people that work in the garment factories get inspired by looking at her every day on their way to work. <laughs> and here they're, they're selling pots. And here is uh, the Xinhua bookstore. Um, I asked where I could find English language stuff. And up on the third floor of this place, Xinhua is also the name of the uh, news agency, the official news agency in, in China. And this was a lovely place, stacked full of Chinese books and also some English. It took me three weeks to find that place. Um, Changshu considers itself to be and has been officially appointed a healthy city in China. And this kind of reflects that. These are public access bicycles, kind of the same notion as the Paris public bicycles. You subscribe, you get a card. These things are electronic. And so you hold the card over this and the bike releases, and then you drop it off someplace else in the city. Uh, you know, click it back into uh, a station and um, you're charged for, you know, whatever, some minimal amount for renting the bike for as long as you were out. And again, you know, I was kind of walking through the Garment uh, Avenue, this big boulevard, and I thought these, these were kind of risque, so I took a picture of them. <laughs> Here's the university. I talked, as I said, 28 hours. Uh, people wanted to know about markets. I talked about the efficiency of capitalism. Um, and all these folks were open to this. Again, this is December. Public buildings in Changshu, anyway, but again, this is the only time I've been there in the winter. But um, there, there isn't any heat, so which is why all these kids are sitting here, you know, bundled up. Everybody, I was there for um, three weeks, and I was cold the entire time I was there, except in my apartment, which I'll show you in just a minute, which had its own little thermostat. I had it at 80 degrees. And so I was, you know, t-shirt and shorts in the apartment, but even outside in the hallway, it was 40 degrees. It was really, really cold. And these kids were cold. Everybody had hot tea. Again, a formal uh, lunch when I got there. And uh, oh, there's me on campus, and there's the, uh, the, the library, the Yifu Library in the background. I have a better picture of it. These were students. Uh, they asked me to speak with students. They asked me to speak with faculty. So here is the student assembly. Um, and I was supposed to talk about what student life was like in the United States for American students. And, you know, I was a student 40 years ago, and so, and so I, talked, I talked about what student life is like now in the United States. And these kids were, they got a big kick that a teacher was taking a picture of them. And I was invited to um, what, we, what was termed a party, but it wasn't in fact a party, it was a, it was a talent show. And I, again, I've been again, a number of times, and every time I've been, I've been invited to talent shows. And these are all students at the university, and some were good and some weren't all that good, but everybody got, a, everybody got a, you know, there are 500 people out here getting a huge kick out of people making fools of themselves sometimes uh, up on stage. There's another class I was talking to. That, this is their instructor, uh, economics instructor, and he's preparing uh, them for my lecture. Again, everybody, all these students have been taking English for years and years and years, they understand what I say, but there are, many of them are shy in, in speaking English because they don't have a great deal of confidence in their English abilities. Uh, uh, part of the campus, my view from um, the little apartment that uh, they put me in, another view of the campus, uh, another class. The woman here, uh, this woman was what I called, and we jokingly said that uh, she was my handler. Uh, she was also an economics teacher, but she made sure that um, I did everything that I was supposed to do, and, and she was very, very gracious, and she invited me out. As a matter of fact, my social life in China was exponentially better than my social life here in the United States. I was invited out in, in the three weeks that I was there. I was invited out more than I have been invited out in the United States for the past 30 years. So, you know, China is a possibility when I get older. <laughs> and again, here's the Yifu uh, Library. And I, when I looked at it, I thought it was, you know, the biggest battleship of a building that I'd ever, ever, I'd ever seen. Also, ice cold inside in December. Yifu Library. 
Um, some cauldron that uh, Dr. Self could probably describe it. Uh, I thought it was very Chinese, so I took a picture of it. Um, and again, looking at the, the compass there, and looking out toward the entrance to the university. This is the, the, the faculty canteen where I took some meals. Um, and the food was excellent. This is their, the gym on campus, the, the physical ed education complex. Another view of the campus, there's the library in the background, and the, the place is beautiful. It's, it's, it's very modern, and uh, the architecture is kind of uh, blocky, but uh, a very beautiful sighting. Again, uh, a water course, uh, part of the lake system uh, along the edge of the campus. Uh, this is a promenade, me promenading. This is, this is Walmart, and this, these are uh, dried uh, ducks and chickens, and uh, there you go. You know, I was kind of a little hesitant to take a picture of this because other people, you know, I really don't like to take pictures um, overtly because it, it, the, the impression is that I perceive this as, as being strange. Uh, and I, I don't want to be, you know, that kind of a, have that kind of tourist mentality. But I took this because I thought it was interesting. Um, Starbucks, the other Starbucks, uh, which is in another mall. Where I stayed, this is uh, looking at uh, outside, uh, and it was a lovely place, and it was warm. It was warm, and there's my laundry out there drying in the sun. And there's the little kitchen. And this is the outside of uh, the hotel apartment complex. And part of it is a hotel for people that are just coming for a couple of days. And my, my apartment was here. here. Here are my clothes out on the porch. And I enjoyed it. I actually felt sad, and I've told people on campus here, I felt bad to leave. And you know, it's kind of a nice thing to say to people, you know, I really hate leaving, but I actually did really hate leaving here. And so I'd, I'd like to go back. The people were absolutely fantastic. Again, I've been there five times. This group of people, the, the faculty, the people that interacted with me, the students, were absolutely the best. This was a Christmas party um, that the, the administration had for foreign teachers. So the woman here is German. And here's a Pakistani fellow, and here's an Indian fellow. And there was another German um, language instructor. German is a popular language in China because lots of students go to Germany as a year uh, uh, abroad. And here's, as a matter of fact, here was a group of students that uh, were going to Germany uh, next year, uh, fall of 2013. And they wanted to know, and I talked to them about the study abroad experience. What's it like for a Chinese student to go to Germany and kind of integrate in Germany. I don't know how I'm supposed to know that, but I talked for like two hours to them about this. And you can't Google that. Um, and here's Professor Gung. She was on campus here uh, last when? fall, fall semester. And here's my handler over here. That's uh, Teacher Wang. Uh, her English name is Summer, Summer Wang. And there's uh, Teacher Wang, this is Teacher Pang, and I, I've forgotten what uh, that fellow's name is. But this is at another um, faculty meeting where I'm supposed to talk about research and how research in the US for faculty differs from research uh, for faculty in, in China. And here's Summer again, and she invited, invited me out like three nights a week, every week that I was there, to the tea house at the library. And, you know, if I was 40 years younger, I would have proposed marriage to her. Because <laughs> I really felt for her. Uh, besides the fact that, you know, we're both married. Uh, but still, she, uh, and she, she actually looked like she enjoyed my company, which is an important thing in marriage, don't you think? <laughs> and this is her student. He kind of, he worked at the tea house, and he gave us tea for free, and he wanted to practice his English, which is whatever all these students want to do when they come up to you. And we sat for two hours in the tea house beyond my bedtime, which is like 9 o'clock, but we sat there until 10 o'clock, and we talked English. And you know, in the time that I met him for a couple of days, in the time that we talked, his English improved, and that's what you have to do if you're an English student. And this is kind of a strange pose for a student and his teacher with his arm around her, but you know, maybe things are different in China. And here's Professor Gung and another uh, economics professor. They invited me out. She was in, at, in, um, in America this year until about the 20th of December. And then she came back. And as soon as she was back, she was assigned to me. 
And so she kept me busy. We went to museums, we went out to lunch, we went out to her house, I have a picture of that, and I'll, I'll try to hurry this up, I know we're late here. And there's, this is a, you know, kind of an upscale restaurant that uh, they took me to, and, and here's a, 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 ca a cafe right downtown, uh, and you had a picture of it. Yammy Coffee. The Yammy Coffee House. Yes. And, yeah. and it's a, just a beautiful place, and I took a picture of the, uh, the, the coffee maker, because I'd never seen one like this before. There's a flame underneath here, and it boils the water, and then the steam goes over to where the coffee is. The coffee goes in here, or something, and it comes out here, and it's some of the worst coffee I've ever had in my life. <laughs> you, don't, you don't go to a, a tea-drinking country and expect to have good coffee in a place like this. You can go to Starbucks, but that's an American franchise, and they, you know, they roast their beans uh, in a particular way. Um, and these folks actually look like they're enjoying my company, which I thought was great. <laughs> and I was invited on Christmas Eve to a Christmas party at the English club of Changshu. So everybody's practicing their English. There's Professor Gung. The woman in the middle is a, a traditional uh, medical doctor, traditional medicine in China. And the woman to the right there is a nurse. And I was very interested in learning about traditional medicine, so we went out the next day and had coffee at, uh, at this place that we were, that I just showed you. Um, and I kind of shied away from the coffee, I had some tea, and talked about traditional medicine in China and what she practices. And you know, this Christmas party is not people getting drunk and having a good time, it's for the kids. Most people in China have one child. And they really regale those kids with essentially everything. Everybody, everything is focused on that one child. And Christmas Day, I was invited to Professor Gung's house for dumplings, she said. Her husband was going to cook. So this is, looking down, this is the Yushan Mountain. It's just over here. This is part of the old campus, kind of a village, the old campus of Changshu uh, Institute of Technology. This is her apartment, which was three levels. You can see the stairway going up. It was absolutely gorgeous. And here's, you know, I included this because uh, this is the first picture I've ever seen of myself smiling since 1968. <laughs> so I include it. The kids are um, kids of other faculty members who were invited to lunch. But, and I put this picture on my website because every time I look at it, I think, wow, you know, I must have been having a good time and I was happy in China, which is good. And here's the food, all vegetarian because they knew that uh, I don't partake of meat and the kids aren't happy about this. I mean, the kids want... <laughs> I mean, the kids want meat. They want hamburger or something. And what we got here is, you know, we got quail eggs. We got old tofu, which was delicious. Old tofu. We have noodles. We have all kinds of vegetables. And the kids were ticked off. <laughs> and here's Professor Gung and her husband, who cooked everything. And he's a physical education teacher at the university. Um, they took me after lunch. They took me to this garden, which was part of, um, they told me, uh, part of a very rich Chinese person's uh, property until the revolution and then it was taken over by the city and again this is December and it's a very beautiful place and this is that woman's uh, child who still doesn't look at me in a favorable way. <laughs> again a bit more of the garden. And um, Professor Gung knew that I, uh, my research is in public health, diabetes, and problems with um, what are called non-communicable diseases, which are becoming more and more of an issue in China. As the country becomes richer, uh, people fall ill to diseases that we have been experiencing as a rich country for a long time, heart disease and cancer and diabetes. So she arranged a meeting at the Ministry of Health. This fellow is the Minister of Health for this province, the entire province of, of Changshu. And I got an hour and a half PowerPoint, all in Chinese, um, about the issues that I was concerned about. And here are Professor Gung and uh, her colleague, who also was here, and I've forgotten her name. Um, what is it? OK. Uh, <laughs> in, fr in front of the uh, Ministry of Health. And um, it, again, I, I have to say, it was the best experience traveling, one of the, the best traveling experiences I've had in my life. And 
And they took me out to dinner on the night before I left. And they look like, again, they look like they're actually having a good time talking with me. Which is absolutely astounding to me, I think. Don't they look like they're having a good time? Yes. And they insisted on paying for the dinner. And I thought, oh, that's too much. So I paid for the dinner. And they were very happy about that. <laughs> because you can't, you can't invite somebody to dinner and then expect them to pay for it. And they realized that, and that's, but, I, but I said that, you know, how much do you make? And they, I make a lot more, and plus I'm getting money. And, and so they said, okay, you pay for it. And they were happy. And here's the Shanghai airport, and that's that. Oh. For my students that are in the audience, we'll have sign-up sheets up here. You'll put your name down, and you'll get credit for coming today. Thank you. There are probably some questions. Okay. So much information. Please feel free to ask questions of our three speakers. Thank you.